Welcome back to the Grounded in Simplicity podcast. I am Danielle from the Rustic Elk, joined by my good friend Bonnie from the Not So Modern Housewife, and we are here helping moms get back to basics and find joy in being less busy. And this week we are talking about whether or not we have created our own problems. Dun dun dun. <laughs> I think the thing is, is like we can we can look at society as a whole. And we can realize that um, obviously like these are going to be generalities and this doesn't like, we're not saying that this is everyone's life. This is everyone's experience. Um, But these are things to keep in mind when you are voting with your dollars. So our first problem being um, the problems with our food supply and having a scarcity mindset. Um, I know we were kind of talking a little bit offline about talking about there's this, there's this mindset or this idea that you need to have money and resources to be able to have healthy food. One thing I've always admired is looking at third world countries, um, specifically a lot of these communities in Africa, and they are finding ways to grow vegetables by any means necessary. And so it's like, you know what, if, if they can do it with almost no resources, then, you know, why can't I do it when I have the space to be able to do it? And I have, you know, the money and the resources and the knowledge, but yeah, you know, you go to these other parts of the world and nobody's doing it fancy. Nobody's got raised beds. They're finding whatever containers they can. They're growing it on their front step or they're growing it on their roof and they, you know, one, they approach the problem with a mindset of wanting to solve the problem, like find a solution. And I think this is something that, I mean, really goes across the board is when you look at something, you can either like you can be discouraging and you can point out all the things wrong with it and all the ways that it's not going to work. Or you can go look at it from a problem solving standpoint and look at the ways that you can get it to work. And a lot of these places that have no resources, they look at everything from the standpoint of how can I get this to work because failure is not an option for them. Right. That's kind of like here, you know, we only have an acre and, you know, yes, we live in a first world country. Yes. I can go to the grocery store and get food. Hopefully I have money. I don't really, but (laughs) you know, we'll pretend I do. And But, you know, at the same time, especially with all of the food shortages that we had and all of these things that have been going on in the world and, you know, all the recent events, um, failure isn't an option. So trying to find ways to make, you know, it work where we're at is, you know, I have to find ways to make it work. Mm -hmm. And if that means that I have to, you know, tear up my entire yard and grow things in places that I don't think they can grow, then that's what I have to do. Or if I have to you know, build 50 chicken tractors and drag them around my yard and let them clear out a big space so I can grow vegetables there and, you know, move, move on to the next chicken tractor, et cetera. You know, there, if there's a will, there's a way. And right. I think, I think that we are, we're spoiled. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because even, you know, we, we go to the grocery and we have, you know, endless amounts of food available that isn't necessarily even really food. And the way that we view, you know, our diets of needing X amount of calories and not thinking about the nutrition that's involved in those calories and thinking, well, you know, I can stuff 10 bags of chips in my cart for the same price as one package of ground meat, then I'm going to buy the 10 bags of chips because the chips are going to go further than the ground meat is. But at the same time, those chips have like, no nutritional, no nutritional value. value. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing too, is th- there's this idea that things shouldn't be hard. And if it's hard, then you, I like, I can't do it. We just, we don't like as a society, as a whole, and again, not saying this is across the board, but as a whole, like we don't think we should ever be uncomfortable. Yes. And if like the things that are uncomfortable are for other people 
and, but it's like you you have to be uncomfortable to grow otherwise mm-hmm. you're going to be stuck right where you're at right and you know what if you're okay with being stuck right where you're at that's fine but then stop getting mad at me because i'm working my butt off and i'm accomplishing more right because you chose to stay stuck i did not right yeah we definitely at least in the united states of course i don't know you know i I would say probably most first world countries we we're all comfortable we're Mm -hmm. all you know we're all we are all like like you said generalized statements but we're all well fed and we have, you know, all of these things right at our fingertips and nothing has to be hard. But at the same time, it's, you know, like to me, it's not easy to go to the grocery store. Right. Like, um, I don't remember who it was. One of the homesteading bloggers said something about choose your heart. Yeah. I mean, you have to choose your heart. It, to me, it's hard to go to the grocery store. It takes me all day. I have to drive, you know, a half hour, 45 minutes to the store. I have to spend two hours in the store. I have to make a list before I even go to the store. You got to put all your crap in the cart. You got to put all your crap on the belt. You got to put all your crap in bags, put it back in the cart, put it in your car, bring it all the way back home and then find places for it. That's hard to me. It's right. not, it's not any more difficult to me to go out to my garden grab some vegetables and either make them for dinner or can them for later or freeze them, et cetera. Yeah. Like you just have to choose what difficult thing you want to do. Yeah. Um, And I'm going to like, I'm going to, even though we're talking about food, I'm going to use cloth diapering as an example for a second. Um, Because like you say, you know, choose your hard. And you know what, if you decide that thing's going to be your hard, but this is not the hit, like this thing over here is not the hill that you're willing to die on it's okay to choose convenience. Mm -hmm. And like, that's one thing that we want to make sure we like get across with this podcast is you don't have to feel obligated to do all the things just Mm -hmm. because we're telling you to be uncomfortable. We're not telling you to like push yourself to your limit. Yeah. There's a Um, difference between being uncomfortable and being overwhelmed. Right. Right. Exactly. Like, you know where I'm at right now. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But so the cloth diapering example, with my, really my two oldest, um, to me, it was so much easier to throw a load of diapers in the washing machine and wash them than having to go all the way to town to buy a case of diapers. Right. Like, I was like, I don't understand how anyone says that disposables are more convenient when one, they're ridiculously expensive. And two, all I have to do is run a load of laundry. Right. Um, by the time I got to kid number three, Cloth diapers were no longer the hill I was willing to die on. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I, I went through a lot of mental health struggles after my daughter was born. Um, and then I had a lot of physical health problems after the, my second son, my youngest was born. And so I just, I got behind in the laundry and I just was not, I had to, I had to let something go. And that was the thing I had to let go. Right. I mean, there's, it's okay. Like there are seasons in life. Right. And that, you know, like it's okay if you go and went and bought a bag of bread at the store instead of making your own three loaves every week or whatever it is. Right. I mean, you have to let things go. You have to, you know, learn the difference between, pushing yourself into being in an uncomfortable place and pushing yourself into overwhelm, which is ultimately just going to make you burn out and right. quit. Right. And I mean, and that's like, you know, let's say you're, you're starting a new habit. You're starting a new routine. When you're first starting that, the hardest thing to do is get started. It's just to take that first step. The more steps you take, And the further along you get and the more things become routine and become automatic for you, you can start to take on more things. And now the stuff that was overwhelming to you a couple years ago is not overwhelming now. So it's not to say you couldn't. I mean, well, okay, yes, some things sometimes they are, but (laughs) sorry, not always. (laughs) I'm just thinking of our jobs. I'm not going to get on a sidetrack because I could tell you all about my morning trying to label plant markers while my 11 year old is trying to like talk my ear off about whatever video game thing he's got going on right now. <laughs> I'm like, I'm sorry, I have earbuds in. I'm listening to an audiobook. I don't hear anything you're saying. And yet he kept talking. 
<sighs> anyway, um, yeah, so choosing are hard. Um, so speaking of audiobooks, I'm actually, I'm still working on Monty Don's book um, that I just forgot the name of. But anyway, one, one thing that I was just listening to him say yesterday was talking about how, um, you know, we design our garden like around our kitchen and what we want to eat. Mm -hmm. And, and he's like, don't plan what you're going to harvest off of like what you're going to cook for dinner. So don't like have a meal plan and then go, these are the ingredients I need, because that's, what's going to end up running us to the grocery store because it's like, oh, well, I didn't grow that. So I got to buy it or it's not ready to harvest yet. So I got to buy it. Right. Because instead go walk through your garden every day, pick everything that's ready to harvest and then decide what's for dinner. Yeah. So that's definitely one way that we can, um, like restructure our environment to make this work better for us. Um, and just, and, and make it more convenient because if you, sometimes you really do have to like re-engineer your environment so that the things you want to do are easier. Well, it's so hard, I think, because, you know, I think as a society, we've been conditioned to think that all that food comes from the grocery store. Like even people that I know that were, you know, completely raised in this type of atmosphere and had gardens and all those things still, you know, feel like, well, the food is at the grocery store. It's, you know what I mean? And so you don't right. think about the food could also be in my living room or my backyard or my basement or whatever. Like a, yeah. a lot of people I know have HOAs, which I think are completely ridiculous and they don't let them have gardens, but you know, where there's a will, there's a way. I think that, you know, if you want to bad enough, you're going to find a container and you're going to grow a tomato in your window or something. Right. And yeah, it might not okay, be everything, so, but yeah, you may still end up buying tomatoes, but you're learning the skill of how to keep a tomato plant alive. Right. And that's something that's, you know, it's right. better than nothing. Um, yeah. I mean, I was, I was fortunate to be able to grow up in a farming community and I did go to um, farms a lot for you pick and stuff like that so that I could, you know, I could buy in bulk and I could freeze and everything. Uh, but yeah, I mean, at the same time, like I think about the um, like uh, hamburger helper and like the junk that we ate in the eighties and nineties and all the processed <laughs> foods. And that was my normal back then. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, like it took, it, it took like moving away and going out on my own to realize I didn't want to eat that stuff anymore. Right. But at the same time, that stuff can become so addicting. Well, right. It I has mean, yeah, all the amount that stuff of salt and sugar and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and Hey, I'm, I am, I'm not afraid of sugar, but <laughs> <laughs> I do try to, you know, control it. Um, I was just having that conversation with my husband this week is he's with gas prices. He's back to working home more and I don't keep soda in the house. We'll drink it if we go out or maybe if we order a pizza, we'll pick up a couple of two liters. But as a general rule, it's just not something I buy on a regular basis. And he's like, you know, without being able to get sodas while I'm at work, I think I'm losing weight. I'm like, gee, it's funny how that works. <laughs> Imagine that guess what? You drink more water. Oh, oh you're going to laugh at me for this. I'm drinking more water now. No, you're I not. I set a habit. I am. I, I set a habit on my phone that I will drink a glass of water every morning as soon as I wake up before my coffee. And I find myself craving water. I told you. I'm not going to laugh at you. I'm just going to say I told you so. drinking coffee now but you know well yeah I'm running on like three hours of sleep uh so i yes. find it it helps you be more awake though like if you drink the water first at least for me if i, I drink know. a glass of water you don't know <laughs> you're not willing to admit i find that. i find that adderall helps keep me awake more <laughs> right. that might be why you only slept for three hours but no it was definitely the in-laws um so let's see. Oh, so back to food. We, well, yeah, we were we were talking about food. I was going to bring up that um, we talked a little bit about um, calories and how they're not all created equal. Oh, yes. And how, yes, the chips are cheaper than, you know, the little package of hamburger. But at the same time, um, those calories aren't created equal. 
and I notice I've been what what groceries we buy at the store and we're gonna buy even less now because we just bought a cow but um the groceries that I buy at the store I've been ordering them because then I'm not going in an impulse buying and buying junk food that I really 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 don't need or want to eat I just mm -hmm. see it and especially if I take my kids they'll see you know like snack cakes or potato chips or something that they just have to right. have. Right. And um, when I go to the store, of course I'm impulse buying too, but most of the impulse buys are junk that we don't really need at all. And my grocery bill is always higher. So that junk food costs more and it, you know, it leaves the house more quickly because I have three mm -hmm. kids <laughs> and they want sugar, yeah. but at the same time it costs more then when I'm just buying, you know, ingredients to make meals or make things from scratch, et cetera, then if I buy like convenience items, like um, even if it's applesauce, mm -hmm. if you buy the cups of applesauce versus the big jar of applesauce, the cups cost more. Right. And considering how quickly my children go through a like bottle of applesauce, there's no way I'm buying those little cups. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, and you know... Honestly, I think that we have tricked ourselves into believing that this food is cheaper when in yeah. reality it's not. Like, I mean, we talk, you talk about the bag of potato chips. It, that's only nine ounces of food. And it's like right. $4 for a bag. That's like, that's more expensive than hamburger. It right. look bigger. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and, and it's more filling up front. You know, if you compare it apples to apples, if you're only eating a small portion of the hamburger and you have to pass it around to everybody and you weren't mixing it with anything else, like putting it mm. in chili or something, you know, to, to stretch it further, then of course it's going to be more filling to eat the bag well, of potato chips. And I, I mean, maybe. like speaking of water, that's a cheap way that we can fill ourselves up and not consume so many calories. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I mean, granted, yes, like, the recommendation I think is to drink a glass of water before your dinner or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. But not just that, like the, the meals that you can cook where you can incorporate more liquid it's or, or more fiber and more vegetables, things like that is, you know, is going to fill you up more and then you're not having to use as much meat. Like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how I can stretch my grocery budget for the week. And so I went and I bought four pounds of hamburger and that is going to make at least four meals for my entire family. And, you know, I'm going to mix it with like, I've got um, canned diced tomatoes and I've got barley and I've got like the frozen diced vegetables and stuff. There's things I'm going to add into each of those recipes so that we will be filled up. Right. You're not just making hamburger patties with it. Right. Or meatloaf. <laughs> you can make meatloaf. Yes, I know I can make. Ways. Well, I don't know. I'm, we are, when we make meatloaf, it doesn't go a long ways. I think that's the problem. Uh, when you're not but doing yeah, it right. <laughs> it's just, well, the problem, I mean, my family will, if given, if left to their own devices, my family will sit there and eat just a slab of meat and no vegetables or anything else. Oh, but yeah, I, don't have, I don't have that problem. Thankfully, like most of the this time. is like, this is why I make shepherd's pie. It's the only way I can get my husband to eat lima beans. Because it's in the lima, you put lima beans in your shepherd's pie. Yes. That's disgusting. Although I don't think I have any lima beans this time. So it's fine. It tastes good. <laughs> Whatever. I don't like lima beans. I'm with your husband on this. <laughs> well, and like recipes like that. So like my, my grandmother was born and raised in Ireland. She came to the States when she was 17. And she just, her family lived on this little like two room house on Inish Turk off the coast of County Mayo and I think she's one of like six kids. So you want to talk about like stretching a food, a food budget and living thrifty. Like she was the master at it. And anytime we would go to stay with her, all of the leftovers for the week would all go into a pot. And that pot would like become some kind of dinner by the end of the week. And I'm pretty sure that's really where the original recipe for shepherd's pie and probably a lot of other things, probably were the original recipe for jambalaya and chili and all of mm -hmm. our regional dishes were just ways to use up the leftovers. Right. Um, and I think we even, I think we even mentioned in a different episode, like talking about ways to make a roast and then like use it th in three meals. I think we'd use chicken. Yeah. We talked about chicken, but you can do it with Rubber any roast. Chicken. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there, there are ways 
to make and, and you know, I think another thing is a lot of people think that we need, you know, tomatoes in the middle of January and tomatoes cost more in the middle of January than they do in the middle of June. Unless um, you live in Florida. Well, yeah, but I'm talking about normal people, Bonnie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Touche. Floridians are not normal. But regardless, you know, for you, it would be a bad idea to buy tomatoes in the middle of June, I would imagine, because they're not in season in Florida in the middle of yeah, June. Yeah, our season's over by June. Right. So, we're, we're you know, California same thing. tomatoes. Buy them in season, even if you're buying them from the grocery store, and it's going to be less expensive than buying them out of season. So, you know, right. think about that in advance, you know, and, and make extra so that, you know, like buy a little bit extra if it's on sale. Even if you're not going to use it right now, you can take that extra portion. You can put it in the freezer and you can, mm -hmm. you know, use it later. I mean, you're, as long as you're cooking the food and using the food, then you're stretching your food dollars the same amount of space. Right. And I mean, obviously, like if you don't have the freezer space, if you don't have the, the equipment to can or whatever, you're not going to be able to store stuff year round. Right. Or as much stuff. And so you know, you're, you're going to have to live even more seasonally, you know, and that's just, that's just the reality of it. Um, because I mean, I think we've seen that our, our food supply is not guaranteed. And I mean, the fact that we're two years into this and I'm still seeing empty shelves and I mean, and, and honestly, like as a retailer, I'm still getting, I still have delays getting supplies and things from my suppliers. Like it's, like, I don't know why it's still broken two years later, but in the way cr current world events are going, it may get even more broken before it gets better. But, you know, and that's, I think that's why community is so important. Yeah. But. Oh, wait, yeah, that's one of our talking points. That I, I was like, we should, probably should like move along. If you're buying from your local community or bartering or whatever you're doing, but if you're getting stuff locally, you, you really have no choice but to live seasonally because they're, if it's not in season, they're not selling it. I, but it's so much cheaper. It's so much cheaper to live seasonally. And, it, and it's healthier yeah. to live seasonally yeah. than it is to try to eat tomatoes yeah. in the middle of January. There's like no nutritional value because they were grown and picked, you know, when they were still green and ripen I mean, on the I, way. I and... won't say there's no nutritional value. But not and... as much as. Right. And I mean, I would still say, you know, if you just got to have your tomatoes in the middle of the winter, again, that goes back to the choose your heart. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, it's, it's better than nothing. Um, but ideally, you know, yes, we'll want to try to you know, go towards eating seasonally. But you know what? I, I like guacamole and a lot of times the guacamole is coming from Mexican avocados. So it is what it is. Right. I mean, you know, there's certain things that, but you know, at the same time, if it wasn't available to you, it wouldn't be the end of the world. Right. You, you find ways to work around it. Exactly. Which brings us to that lovely community and how nobody seems to want community anymore. Yes. Well, <laughs> I mean, it's, look, I get it. There are just some people that are hard to like. And um, I am an introvert and I will avoid crowds and I will avoid going to town on the weekends because it's too peopley out there. Uh, but when I find my people, like I, I feel seen. <laughs> <laughs> and I can spend all day with my people. Um, the hard thing is the number of people out there who see this lifestyle and are just like, you know, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your money. This is costing you too much money. You know, it just, you know, just all across the board. And that's, you know, and, and I don't want to spend time with those people because again, like they're not looking at anything from a problem solving mindset. They're just looking at everything that's wrong with the lifestyle that I've chosen or everything that could go wrong. Right. Or everything that's wrong with the world and you're not fixing it. Which kind of, a, right. Yeah. Right. And you know, I'm a murderer and why am I harming mm. innocent animals when I can just go buy meat from Walmart? 
Yeah, I'm pretty sure we're on the uh, you shouldn't buy meat at all now. I'm pretty sure that's where we're Oh, at. that's right. We're supposed to be eating lentils. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they are. Apparently, contrary to scientific proof, um, definitely nutritionally equivalent to protein. Here's the thing, folks. I I have an I got an A in my college nutrition class. There are no plant based proteins that are a complete protein. Now, you like the reason beans and rice are so popular in low low income areas, or why they gained popularity in low income areas, is yes, when you combine a starch and a legume, then you get a mostly complete protein. But it's still it's still rice and beans at the end of the day. <laughs> I'm not getting into this. I will get on a soapbox and I won't get off of it. <laughs> it's, I mean, and what, what really gets me is like people that are like, oh, well, if you're doing this, if you're like, if you're raising animals for meat, then you must not care about the animals. No, I'm raising animals for meat because I care about the animals. Like I I saw how commercial animals were being raised and like, I was like, you know what, if I can, if I can keep even some animals from that being their, the only life they know, then it's better than nothing. Right. I mean, I'm not going to stop Purdue and Tyson from their, you know, mass production of meat chickens. But if I can have, you know, my couple dozen over here that are enjoying a free range life, are enjoying sunshine and grass and fresh air and all this before it's time, then at least I'm giving that couple dozen chickens a better life. Right. You know? But, yeah. So, I don't know. I don't know how we kind of got off that. But, but the thing is, like, we can't, we just, we can't shun all community. Like we need, we need community and there's a definite purpose for it in this lifestyle, but you have to find your tribe. Like you have to find your people. It baffles me that people want to live in urban areas, but they don't want community. They don't want to, they don't want to deal with people. I, well, there's, I, yeah. Like, I, I don't understand that. I, I <laughs> want to live in a rural area for lots of reasons, but part of it is because... I'm an introvert and don't do well in crowds and urban areas yeah. make me cringe. <laughs> yeah. Same here. No. Um, you know, and I mean, uh, like society as a whole has changed so much because, you know, and, and granted, I don't, I guess maybe it's just because of where I grew up. I grew up in a farming community. It was nothing for someone to just stop, stop by because they saw your car in the driveway and they wanted to say hi. Right. Um, but even in rural but, areas, that's not so common anymore. Well, right. That's the thing. Like, if my neighbors are stopping by my house, it's probably going to be to tell me what I'm doing wrong or like to <laughs> criticize something. Or that your dog is out or something. Right. Like, no one's coming to see me and, right. or no one's like wants to ask me a question. It's we we've become a very self-centered society where it's all about how everything affects me. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, like we, we have to, I mean, I think we correct that by getting back to community, but like we need to stop looking at everything from our own lens. Like we need to kind of look, have more empathy look at things from another person's point of view we're not all going to do things the same right. and i mean honestly like one thing that has really driven me nuts with the homesteading trend is the pet livestock trend that's gone along with it because <laughs> because now like that's the standard that we're supposed to hold all of our livestock to Right. Even if it's not necessarily the what's best for them. It's just what makes us feel better as humans. Like right. if we're treating them like a human child, then we see that as we're, we're doing the best thing for them. When in reality, the best thing for them is to go live out in a herd and do, do goat things, do pig things. Like, 
Right, right. <clears throat> I think we, because we've gotten so detached from our food, mm -hmm. because everybody buys it at the grocery store, I think it's very, very difficult for us to detach our emotions from it. Right. And, you know, I think, I mean, I see a lot of people that say that they could never butcher an animal because it makes them uncomfortable. But here we are again at the, you have to do things that make you uncomfortable. And, right. and you know, I don't, and, and like, I don't honestly, feel like it's right to pawn that responsibility off on somebody else. Right. And I mean, killing, killing anything should not be easy and comfortable. Right. Exactly. Like, it's not like we're sitting there smiling and laughing and carrying on, carrying right. on. on I mean, know, okay. Yeah. Names. Maybe when we're posing for a picture, but <laughs> like, I mean, again, that's a, that's a snapshot and I'm smiling because otherwise the resting bitch face takes over. Okay. So <laughs> I need to smile. Otherwise everyone's going to ask me what's wrong. All right. Uh, but I hate when my husband does that. What's the matter with you? <laughs> Nothing. It's just my face. <laughs> my face is just wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to make that face out loud. Um, yeah, it, you know, and honestly, I have my husband do most of the killing part because right. I have a hard time with it. Yeah, you know? like, <clears throat> my husband also does most of the killing, but, you know, once he, you know, like when we're doing chickens, once once they bleed out, it's, you know, I'm I'm right in there doing the process. And I can do it. I have done it, but it's definitely right. not my favorite thing. Like, and he, honestly, like he my usually goes hunting. Do it faster, so I feel right. like it's more humane to have him do it. Right. Like when we go hunting, he usually does the hunting. So, right. and I finally shot a deer and I remember I, sh I shook for like three hours. So there was that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not easy guys. It's not like, you know, we're going out, you know, all excited that we're going to take life. It's more that we know that we need to eat and, you know, right. and, and yes, there's food in the grocery store, but that food in the grocery store lived a far worse life than any of the food that you find out in the wild or that was raised on a small family farm, you know, even if it was only the end of their lives that were terrible, you know, mm -hmm. they still, you know, the food at the grocery store lived a terrible life in comparison to the food that you raised yourself or was raised on a small farm near you or, you know, whatever. Yeah. And we, we have to realize that, you know, we all, there, there's a circle to life and we all have to eat. Yes. Well, and like, if you look back at, the native Americans when they were hunting and stuff like they would actually say a prayer every time, you know, they harvested right. because like they, they were acknowledging that that animal gave its life to sustain our lives. Right. And it was like, it was a, it was a passing of the life force or the energies. Or, you know. And so, I mean, I still think, I think that's one thing that we have the honor of being able to experience as homesteaders and raising our own meat is that we can we can understand the significance of that right and i think that's you know kind of where we get into you know whether or not we should be eating meat protein etc cetera, etc cetera, is because you know your average person hasn't experienced that they haven't experienced how animals should be raised you know mm -hmm. they only see you know the big broad picture of you know like cafos and things like that and it's not that's not how they should be raised. You know, we're fighting the same fight in that arena because, you know, we don't like it. They don't like it. I don't think anybody really like, I don't even right. think the farmers that actually do it like it. It's just a means to an end. This episode was brought to you by Kitchen Botanicals, your sustainable gardening headquarters. Stop by kitchenbotanicals.com and get a look at our 2022 seed varieties, as well as supplies and pest control products to help you with your organic garden. 2022 is a great time to take care of yourself with our Pampered Gardener subscription box. Every month, you'll receive all natural self-care products, untreated heirloom seeds, high-quality garden tools, organic garden amendments, cute and practical supplies 
supplies, and fun products that we know you'll love. This is your opportunity to take care of yourself in the garden. I started the Pampered Gardener subscription box because I had gone through a time of not taking care of myself and dealing with the stress that it put onto my body. I was ill, I was tapped out, and I felt like I couldn't possibly pour any more out of my empty cup. So I created the Pamper Gardener subscription box for women like me who wanted to get back to what they enjoy, but also wanted to love themselves. So we've put together this collection of gardening and self-care products that are geared towards women who love to garden. You'll get things such as gloves, lotion, bags, hats, sunscreen, mosquito repellent, things that you can actually use, but also things that you'll enjoy. And don't worry, there will still be plenty of gardening tools, seeds. We've created a subscription box like no other. Buy gardeners for gardeners. Order your own box today. Yeah, I mean, and I think that, I think most of the farmers are trying to do what they feel is best. Um, I mean, like, you know, I worked on a dairy where honestly the cows weren't treated very well. And guess what? The milk production showed. Right. You know, on dairies where the cows are cared for and they're having their needs met and they feel satisfied um, because like they're, they, animals don't feel the same emotions we do. But anyway, when they were feeling satisfied, they produce the same, like they, they produce more milk. Or if it's chickens, they're going to produce more eggs. Because guess what? A stressed out chicken doesn't lay eggs. Nope. Um, if it's not so, winter, that's the number one problem that chickens have. If they're not ill and it's not winter, is they're just stress. stressed out. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, it's, there's a lot of, like, it, so I think, I think that farmers are doing their best. I mean, granted, oh, yeah. they are, you know, they're having to do things on such a large scale nowadays that they they have to like they can't give everything the personal attention that we can do on a small scale right you know it's kind of like why i get really annoyed with people that are giving chicken advice but like they only have six chickens <laughs> like i didn't even start with six chickens so. <laughs> right it's it's just it's like you know you have to do things so much differently the more you get Right. And the larger scale you expand to. So it's, you know, it's easy to say, hey, you need to like pick up your chickens every single day and make sure they have good weight and make sure they don't have lice and, you know, all this kind of stuff. It's like when you've got 50 chickens, you're not picking up 50 chickens every single day. Nope. Like that's going to be the entire a whole, day. I had a whole seven rabbits and didn't catch the eye infection until, you know, like three, three or four days into open eyes because even though there's only seven, I mean, I, I grab them and look at them, but it's not something that you necessarily notice. You know what I mean? Right. You know, well, you and when they're up and all, you're hoping you got all of them. <laughs> right. They're all in varying stages of the eyes right. opening and rabbits are like constantly moving. Um, I was trying to get a picture of some of our new little kits this morning and I just about had to do it as a video because the one just kept jumping. Like I, their eyes are still closed. Right. But it felt the, it felt me pull the hair back off of the nest. And so it just mm -hmm. started jumping in place. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's stuff happens like it, we don't intend for it to happen. Right. But we're um, all, you know, we're only human. We're not, you know, nobody's perfect. And right. I, I put up the monocropping cropping and globalization of food because, um, we kind of went off on that and started talking. I know about, we're you know. kind of like, we're, everything's getting <laughs> blended together. Yeah, that's all right. I Most mean, people aren't going to see this anyways. Well, that's true. Okay. <laughs> but if you're, if you, if you're just listening to us, you can actually go to my YouTube channel, the not so modern housewife and see our lovely bullet points on the screen. <laughs> um, anyway, I, th so, yeah. I think farmers, you know, regardless, I, I, I loathe monocropping. I think it's the bane of human existence because, you know, we've depleted our soils and it requires all these petrochemicals in order to be, you know, efficient and productive and, and have high yields so that we can, you know, feed the masses. And I think it's a terrible, it's a terrible farming model in my opinion. But at the same time, I realize that farmers that are doing this are just trying to do their best. Yeah. And well, and makes that's money, of course, because well, right. I mean, yeah, they've got to be able to pay the bills and feed their families. Right. Um, yeah. And it's like, 
you know, I, I actually remember when the no till movement really started to gain ground in the nineties when, like when, when roundup really became popular because, um, the farmers, I mean, for, for generations, but especially like this last 30, 40 years have been dealing with their kids don't want to take over the farm and mm -hmm. they're having, and yet like their, their buyers, like their grain buyers or milk buyers or whoever they have, like, they're like, you have to produce more or else you're not worth the pickup to us. Right. So they have to do a certain scale just to be able to sell their product because otherwise the people don't want to come and pick it up from them because it's not worth the gas to come and get it apparently. And so they're having to, they're having to farm thousands of acres to, to keep up with demand and to have a, enough product to be able to sell, but they're having to do it with less and less physical labor. Right. So they're having to rely on more equipment and anything that can cut out that, that labor cost or that, you know, that labor piece of it. Right. So yeah, we become reliant on monocropping because you can't exactly run a combine through a field that's been companion planted because now you've got beans and corn going into the same hopper and that's not going to work. Right. Um, and then, you know, and, and the big selling point with the no-till movement is, Hey, you can cut out steps. You don't have to till your fields before you plant anymore because you can just spray this and it'll kill the weeds. Mm -hmm. And, oh, look, we've actually developed these soybeans and this corn that won't be killed by our pesticide or our, our herbicide. herbicide product. Yeah. So now you don't have to worry about weeds choking out your crops. Just spray this over the top and everything will be fine. Like it just it just progressed. But again, it was sold as look at how much labor and time we can save you. And how high are your yield going to be? Right. Because in farming, it's all about yield and how much. Right. Well, more, and you know, and the more that's this, not snuffed out by weeds, the more you yield and the higher yeah. you yield, the more money you make. There, there is this narrative that <clears throat> without, without GMOs, we can't produce enough food to feed the world. The problem with that is, I mean, yes, I realize in a lot of ways here in the U S we have, we have been able to increase the amount of food we produce per acre. Um, I'm not necessarily convinced that GMOs had a hand in that. And you can also see other countries that were sold GMOs as, you know, this godsend that's going Panacea. to solve all of their problems. Right. And I mean, and put all these farmers out of business. And I mean, a lot of them ended up having to file bankruptcy and they committed suicide because the crops failed or they In couldn't India. produce as India much. was a big one. Yeah. And I mean, and you're talking <clears throat> about a culture where just failure is not an option like it and it's not that they don't have a backup but so much uh, like they put such a high moral value on your productivity that you are literally worthless as a person if you cannot produce and provide for your family so it's not it's not the the perfect solution that we want to pretend it is well you know you start looking at all these countries that have banned them and don't import our crops because you know there's no guarantee the prevalence yeah right well there's no guarantee even i know um i think it was in canada there's no guarantee that rapeseed from canada is going to be um non-gmo because there's so much gmo rapeseed in canada i know it's canada and i know it's rape right seed, that they stopped being able to export to certain countries anymore even if they had organic or non-GMO because there's no guarantee that it is because it's all, it's right up next to one another and there's all this cross pollination going on and there's no guarantee that. Yeah. And I mean, that's what seed. we've run into issues with soybeans <clears throat> and corn. Like, okay. Yes. Like technically speaking, you cannot buy GMO seed unless you are under a contract. Like you have to sign right. a contract for it, but that doesn't mean that it hasn't cross pollinated and hurt the genetic components of non-GMO seeds. Right. And like, I know, um, for instance, uh, Baker Creek, rareseeds.com, <clears throat> they, they test their corn, their heirloom corn, to make sure that it does not contain GMO genetic material. And there are a number of corn varieties that they have s stopped selling because they could not find any of the seed that was not cross-pollinated with GMOs. Right. 
Um, I mean, it's not to say that it doesn't exist. You know, there, there are still corn and soybeans out there that are non-GMO. But it's, it's something that we have to keep in mind that it's like this isn't, this isn't the innocent thing that they want us to think it is. No, I mean, at least I don't, I don't think it is. I think that, you know, but it, it's a problem that we've created for ourselves because, you know, there, we've globalized food to the point of no return. Mm -hmm. And, but at the same time, now we have all of these GMO crops and things that we can't even export to different countries. And so these countries are having to produce their own. And I think, you know, at least here in the U.S., you know, a lot of people look at GMOs as, you know, this panacea still. And and I don't really think they are. I think we have to farm on such a large scale most of the time, or it looks like we do, that we don't see a way around it. But I think, you know, if we looked at things from a more, you know, regenerative agriculture type of thing and more people were involved in the production of food instead of it, you know, what is it like less than 2% of our population farms. Right. I th and if more There's people were involved in, in the production yeah. of food, instead of everybody thinking that food comes from the grocery store. And that kind of goes back to the whole community thing and, you know, being more involved in the community and realizing that, you know, Somebody told me a long time ago that without globalizing food that half the world wouldn't eat. I don't think that's true. I, I right. think that there Their is diets enough. May change. Right, exactly. But. We might not be eating bananas and avocados, but you know, I think I think if we looked at it in, from less of a scarcity mindset and started looking at it from a more abundant mindset, mm -hmm. we would realize that you know, if we're willing to choose our heart and put some work in, then a lot of these problems that we have with rising food costs and shortages and fuel costs and all these things and fertilizer and grain and all these things that have like gone sky high, I don't think it would be as big of a problem. Not saying it wouldn't exist. It just wouldn't be right. as noticeable. I mean, I think if we had the resources, we, we would be in a better position to be able to opt out. Right. Like, um, you know, oh, sorry, that, you know, the flour is too expensive. And so I'm going to use my alternative instead. Or, right. You know, as an example. Um, I mean, I th like you mentioned regenerative agriculture. And the thing that I see most common is there's this idea that it's not possible to do it on a large scale. And I mean, my thing is like nature's provided us everything we need mm -hmm. to be able to produce food and be able to grow food. Like if you, if you left a forest to its own devices, like it, it would create its own food forest, essentially. Mm -hmm. The things would pop up where they thrive the best and other things would grow in other areas. Right. Um, there is one theory that the rainforest is actually a food forest that was planted by the native tribes because like there's the, the placement of trees and the spread, like the, the, availability of like certain trees and certain species in areas where they don't believe they're originally native, things like that. And, and they were, I mean, granted, yes, I realized that was during a time when we had a much lower population, but I, I think that if, again, if enough people approached it from a problem solving mentality and looked at, okay, how, like, how can we recreate this on a large scale? or to what scale could we recreate this, then I think we'd be a lot better off. Because otherwise I can see us burning all of the fertility out of the soil if we keep at the rate we're going. We pretty much have. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, I look out at the fields around here and there's, there's not. They're dust bowls. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And, we're, you know, we're, we're creating the same problem that we had, you know, that led to the Great Depression during the great depression because we've you know depleted our soil to the point where you know how do you fix it and i don't think that you can fix it without animal agriculture first off because you need those inputs that you cannot get from you know petrochemicals you, you just you can't right i mean and i mean honestly like can we really do chop and drop on thousands of acres that's i, I mean <laughs> <laughs> yes, sure. Maybe we can. Maybe like maybe we can go and take all the corn silage and spread it all over the fields and and replant. I mean, you know, 
maybe someone out there has figured out the science and that's our solution to large scale regenerative agriculture. But yeah, that's um, one that uh, Megan that I follow on, I think, I think her name is like Megan Dairy Girl or something like that on TikTok. And she gets, she gets all the people coming out of the woodwork that want to slam on commercial dairy production. Right. Um, meanwhile, I want to come live in her dairy barn, but that's just me. <laughs> her cows have water beds. Oh, wow. Um, but anyway, so, or I think it's technically her parents, the, the parents' barn. She actually just moved her herd to her fiance's farm because they're getting married, but whatever. So, so a lot of people come onto her TikTok talking about how like the cows are causing global warming, you know, don't worry about the cities and the smog and the fuel and all the, you know, petro gasoline and, and all this. It's the cows. So, um, and she like, uh, I think her degree was in, it was in dairy science. Um, but she's like, she's very good at the science piece of dairy operations and everything. Um, and they're like, the entire dairy industry is actually going to be carbon neutral like in the next five years because of the amount of manure that they're turning around and like putting onto their fields. Right. And because cows sequester carbon. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's a thing. <laughs> and yeah, like, yeah, they, it, it balances. Right. Um, I mean, really the only piece they have to figure out or, or they have to work towards now is like getting the barns as energy efficient as possible. Right. But just like, if we're just talking about the methane that cows produce, they're offsetting it by spraying that manure on the fields, which is also the same, the same fields they're using to grow the food for the cows and, you know, whatever else they're also feeding. Right. I think if more people, you know, instead of thinking of things and how we can do things on such a large scale, like we can do a smaller scale, a lot more. Right. And, well, and, and, you know, accomplish the same, the same means to the same end, because, you know, you still have to feed people and not every, I, I realize not everybody wants to farm. Not everybody wants to have a garden and all of those things, but you know, we use our land mass in such a terrible way. Like mm -hmm. it's, and then, you know, we keep getting people out of farming. And so fewer people are growing even more food than they were, you know, a decade ago. And it just keeps getting less and less and less as we, you know, make this big urban areas. We have all this urban sprawl that eats up even more land that could have been used, you know, more efficiently right. to actually feed people instead of, you know, having a pavement paradise. Yeah. I mean, that's like, that's becoming a huge problem here in Florida is I don't, I don't think a lot of people realize that Florida was one of the top um, beef producers in the country. And I mean, granted, like, yes, our orange groves have taken a hit because of citrus greening. Um, and there was a push to convert a lot of those groves to peaches. Um, but more and more, we're just seeing the groves ripped up and sold to developers. And the same thing with the cattle ranchers. So, you know, they can't like they, they, they can't keep up with the. The, the sprawl that's happening. I mean, they're getting, you know, whether they sell or not, everything's going to get developed up around them. Right. And like when we, when we lived in Bozeman, um, my husband worked for the um, dairy company there. He was mm -hmm. a truck driver for him. And his boss told him that dairy used to be in the middle of nowhere. Right. And now it's in the middle of town and it yeah. just keeps getting worse and worse. And the sprawl just keeps spreading. And what used to be an itty bitty little Western farming community with, you know, big dairy farms and cattle, beef and all those things is now this big, you know, urban center in the middle mm. of absolutely nowhere. <laughs> but, right. you know, it's, it's, you know, very, very populated and, you know, for the size of it and what used to be farmland no longer is, it all got taken up by, you know, housing and, <clears throat> you know, oh, yeah. businesses and all of these things that. Yeah. When I first moved down here, I lived on a horse farm in Tampa and it was on the end of a dead end road and we had an orange grove next door, which we could go riding in the orange grove, but you went out, out our street and it was, I mean, we were full on in the middle of town. Right. Um, and ultimately like we had a, 
essentially an orphanage on the one side of us. Um, they called it children's home. So, but there, there were families that lived there, but then the, the, who actually worked for the orphanage. And then there were the kids who, you know, placed there. Um, but once the owners of the citrus grove made the decision that they were going to sell and move up here to Brooksville, um, then like the farm that I lived on, it was only 10 acres. And she's like, I, I might as well sell too, because I don't want to have houses right there next to the horse barns. Right. You know, and not to, not to mention like you get people that end up building right up against a farm all of a sudden, like you're getting all these calls because of the smell, the flies that, you know, and all of the farm things. Right. That, that, are, that are just part of producing your food. Right. <laughs> and I mean, and guess what? Like, I mean, those stalls were cleaned twice a day. The manure was hauled out once a week. You know, everything was immaculate, but there's still going to be flies and smell. It's just, right. it is what it is. Not to mention dust during the dry season. And it's just not worth dealing with that headache. Because right. someone like someone is going to get a wild hair up their butt and decide to make your life miserable. I mean, we definitely and, have a lot of urban sprawl here, you know, especially, you know, you get down around the Indianapolis area or up in Fort Wayne or over towards Chicago and Hammond and Gary. But um, here, what I've noticed is in the rural areas, like where we live, mm -hmm. um, the farmers, children sold off an acre with a house on it and maybe a barn. And right. kept the rest of it and they cash crop everything. Oh, yeah. So you can't buy, like, it's very, very difficult to find large tracts of land in Indiana. Well, in northern Indiana, anyway. And if you do, it's harder than heck to buy them because there are no comparable properties to them. And so a bank doesn't want to lend money on a 25-acre property because everything around you is one. So it makes it yeah. difficult for people that do want to do something and actually, you know, try to, you know, farm it in some way regeneratively or however, and have their own little, you know, homestead or community or whatever it may be. It makes it very, very difficult. Yeah. Uh, do you guys have cough tax there? Do you know? Mm, I don't think so. Um, it's a thing in Ohio and I can't remember. It's commercial agriculture or something. Um, so basically your property taxes are based off of um, the value of the crop that you sell that year. No. I don't and do that here. it, um, what ends up happening in Ohio is like, they'll have, you know, pretty standard years where the, the taxes stay the same. And then maybe one year, like prices shoot up and now they're taxed on that higher value for, for the crop. Mm hmm. And then that's when all of a sudden you start seeing these little lots on the outskirts of fields go up for sale and end up with houses on them because they had to sell off a few acres to pay the taxes for that year. Yeah, I don't think that we do. I, I don't know anybody specifically that owns a farming business that could tell me otherwise. And we certainly don't, but I don't think we have that. We may have in the past. Yeah. It kind of, I, I don't agree with, I mean, granted one, I've been out of Ohio for a while um, and I don't like, totally understand it but one thing that i noticed the most when i went up um or i don't know one time when i went up is there used to be buffers between areas like to control runoff and control erosion mm -hmm. and this was one of those years where they were going to end up having to owe a lot more in taxes so they started plowing into those buffers to try to plant as much crop as possible because they were going to have to sell more to pay more taxes that year. And the problem that I see is that now you have less erosion control and it, it's going to be, you know, harder on the ecosystem in the right. long run. And that, I mean, honestly, I feel like that's just a government created problem. Like the, the way that they've set that tax up. I think most things are government created problems, but well, yes. <laughs> so yes, I guess to sum up, um, I mean, the biggest thing with any of these is definitely like one, if, if you're, if you're buying your food, shop with your dollar or vote with your dollars, you know, if like, if you don't agree with the practice practices of a certain product practices of a certain company, then don't support that company. Right. And I'm not saying like, we all need to jump on social media and 
declare that everyone boycotts X, Y, and Z, because honestly, I hate that. Um, it's very rarely based on facts. It's always based on someone's emotional opinion and, you know, a decision they made in the spur of the moment. Um, but also, like, it doesn't have to be an all or nothing either. You know, if, if all you can do is produce a little bit more of your food, then that's just less that's going towards the, the big operations or going towards, you know, supporting a system that you don't agree with. Right. And, it, you know, it gets you closer to being able to opt out eventually, even if you're not in a position to do so now, so that in the future, you'll already have that knowledge, even if you just did, you know, the bare minimum little bit that you were able to do when you were able to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for the parts that you can't do, find members of your community that can help with those parts. You right. Know? Like even push um, outside of your comfort zone. Yes. Yes. Push out, even like a lot of uh, local farmers markets and stuff, they take food stamps and snap and all of those things at almost any vendor, you know, there, there are ways to, you know, spend your, food dollars in a more local economy so that you're not, because, you know, in one way, shape or form, you're paying for that globalized food economy, right? Because you're, you're paying for it to travel all those miles. You're paying for, you know, you're paying for it nutritionally because the products, while they do have nutritional value are nutritionally inferior to something that was grown locally, especially if it was grown locally in an organic or regenerative way based off, you know, as opposed to something that was grown, you know, halfway around the world and was raised using petrochemicals to spray all the weeds to kill them off and all of those different things. I mean, you know, right. you have to learn to use your money more, more wisely, I guess. Yeah. I mean, and really like the more your food has to travel, the more it's going to be impacted by like increased fuel costs. Mm-hmm. So if you're buying locally, yes, that farmer may have had to pay more in fertilizer or pay more in, you know, diesel for the tractor or whatever, but it's still a whole lot better than what it actually costs to ship stuff across the country or across the world. Right. And, you know, find your people and, you know, find, find a community and, Look into, you know, community gardens and things like that if you're in a more urban or, or suburban area so that, you know, you can learn those skills where there's a will, there's a way. You have to get out of your comfort zone. I don't like people either. So, <laughs> Yes. Sometimes, I don't know. I, I can say sometimes we have to grin and bear it, but I even get in trouble when I just try to grin and bear it. So, Well, yeah. But, you know, your, your people are out there. They might not be where you expect to find them. They might not be, you know, exactly like you, of course, but you, you might know, be in gonna... Florida and your people might be in Indiana. Yeah. See, <laughs> and, I have and that's people another here thing, too, but yeah, I have people here, but that's another thing though. You know, your community does, in, in our modern world, your community does not necessarily have to be right there. Yes. You need community right there so that, you know, you can maybe, learn to work together to provide your food and all of those things. But at the same time, you know, like I can text Bonnie and ask her a question. And she does. <laughs> bon Bonnie doesn't ask me questions. And then I turn around and then I turn <laughs> around and text her a coffee meme and TikTok videos. <sighs> you keep me sane. It's usually because Bonnie's just trying to keep her head above water. Let's just face it. Right. I gave up. I gave up trying to do that. So, all right. But you, but you can find them online too. Yes, they're there. Yep, we exist. And sometimes you find them online, and then you meet them in person. Sometimes that's actually pretty much how I met most of my local chicken and goat people. Yeah, the, and my uh, local horse people. We, I've done that with a few people where we found um, hay or um, meat or something, and met people. I met them online and then, you know, we ended up meeting because they lived locally. So, right. So, yeah, it's possible. It's possible. But we created our own problems. <laughs> well, to sum it up. <laughs> that's a given. All right. 
I mean, I can't say things were working perfectly a hundred years ago. We just had a different set of problems. Oh yeah. But, um, I don't, I, I don't necessarily think that things have changed for the better in all regards. So. No, I think we have, you know, our, our so-called solutions have actually made problems worse and compounded them and created more and more problems. And then we try to come up with more solutions and, you know, cause humans are obviously smarter than nature. We like to think so. Yeah, I know. I think that's the biggest problem of all. <laughs> we all want to play God mm -hmm. and it doesn't work that way. No, it never works out in the end. Nope. All right. Well, I think that is it for this week and we'll catch you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Grounded in Simplicity podcast. If we were able to help you in any way, please share this episode with a friend and also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. You can also join us over on Patreon at Grounded in Simplicity and help to support this podcast as well as become a patron and get a behind the scenes look at the creation of our podcast and even have some input on future episodes.